little different from a lot of my Fire Emblem content. Today I want to go over some of the items in Dragon Ball The Breakers. At first when I played it, I was a little lost on what a lot of items did, how important some of them were, and honestly, even now, I'm a little unsure about a lot of this stuff. But after thinking about it for some time, and you know, going back and watching a lot of other people's gameplay, I think that I've got a couple ideas on what a lot of the items can be useful for, and maybe that'll be able to help people for when the game actually comes out. The first thing I would like to talk about are the radars. In my opinion, the radars are the most important part of the game. No, they don't give you any physical power like a lot of the other items do, but they give you something else. Information. Uh, despite all the action, adventure, stealth, and exploration, in my opinion, Dragon Ball The Breakers is a very resource-heavy game. If I were to rank the radars, I would rank them like this. The third most important radar is the Dragon Radar. The second, the Civilian Radar. And the first, the Power Key Radar. The Power Key Radar is imperative to a swift game. Knowing where the keys are allows you to plant them as early as possible, and if you can get to the defense stage early, the raider may not be in their final form. Because resources drop from the sky to help survivors, it's possible to overwhelm the raider while trying to defend the time machine, or hold them off for long enough with the threat of two or more strong warriors. The person with the key radar doesn't need to plant the keys. Just find a key in an area and move along. Leave it to your teammates without radars to plant the keys, this allows you to move on as quickly as possible and gather them all. This radar is also the most useless for a raider. If a raider tries to camp out a key, they risk survivors getting more powerful than them. The keys can't help them become more powerful at all, so it's the safest radar for you to use and focus in on. The rescue radar is the most immediately useful to all parties, both the raider and the survivors. Civilians are power for both sides. Every person you save is someone the raider can't use to power up. It also means that you get ever closer to matching the raider and fighting back. In a coordinated team, you can gang up on the raider, but even if you can't coordinate, it's important that you use this radar. Having more strength means that the raider needs to be more careful with how they interact with you. One wrong engagement can mean death for the raider with the right setup. You could even stall for time while other players are getting even more powerful or help slow down the raider while the key radar users are setting up the time machine. There are other items that can help with this radar's ability, such as the scouter, but I honestly think that this is the most important and most useful radar, though that might just be because of how I like to play. This radar gives the player that has it a greater responsibility than the key radar. Rather than rely on others to clean up what you find, this one gives the player the opportunity to catch up with the raider and act as a defense against them. You can leave the energy that you saved from civilians behind, but that won't be as helpful because you can't really tell your teammates, hey, run from whatever you're doing, come over here, pick up this energy. Even then, leaving it behind would be more useful than letting the raider get that energy. Finally, the dragon radar. In my opinion, this is more useful to the raider than it is to the survivors, but it is a very useful tool for scouting. The dragon balls are powerful, so you want to keep them away from the losing party. For the raider, the Dragon Balls are a method of matching your strongest form, or giving everyone the power to fight back against you. For the survivors, the Dragon Balls can make the raider power up even after you've done everything possible to stop them, or it can make the raider fresh and healthy. If you only have a few minutes left to beat them, this could really ruin your plans. If the raider has a Dragon Ball, you can keep track of where they are by looking at the radar while they're within range, but that goes both ways and the raider won't have the issue of wondering if the other moving Dragon Ball is a teammate. And while verticality can save you, it's very tough to hide from the raider in this game. Making sure the raider can't gather all seven is important, but turning yourself into a walking target over it isn't the greatest solution either. While the raider's key sense has a 30 second cooldown, they can use the dragon radar to get an approximate sense of your location at any time, and since gathering all seven Dragon Balls doesn't solve either of the objectives, it can be a risk to go for it. Next, I want to talk about a couple of items. Since I just talked about the Dragon Radar, I'll talk about the Dragon Balls next. The Dragon Balls can turn any match around, letting one person match up with the Raider while everyone plays support and guarantee a win. Or, if you have a few teammates that are stronger than the Raider, entrust them to protect the Dragon Balls. If the Raider is gung-ho on getting the Dragon Balls, you can distract them while everyone else does their part. Once all the civilians have been rescued, the raider's only chance at getting stronger is either killing players or making a wish. Wishing to become level 4 to fight the raider is very useful, 
but the other players around you are still in danger. Unless the raider is level 4, this may not be a great move. If you trust yourself, go for it, but an army of level 3 characters will be better than one level 4 character. Trying to 1v1 the raider is a bad time, even if you're on the same level. Their special moves have more power than your skills, and whether the raider is level 2 or 4, they can still hurt you if they catch you at the right moment. If you lose at the level 4 transformation, you'll be sent back to the level that you were at prior to making the wish, and if the raider is, well, stronger than what you were at, that could be a little dangerous. But if you raise everyone's levels, you can power them up to the point that they can fight the raider. Coordinating an offense leaves the raider with little escape routes unless they've saved their map destruction ability. It also allows each person to try and hold off the raider while reinforcements arrive to turn the tides. If the raider never reaches level 4, you won't really need level 4. Each wish should be made with your teammates in the match's progress in mind. If you're fortunate enough to get the Dragon Balls early on, yeah, level 4 lets you act as an eternal guardian while other players do their thing. Alternatively, you can raise everyone's levels so that everyone can act as a sentry while trying to face off against the raider. If you're the raider, early on you'll probably want to wish to level up. This allows you to outpace the survivors, they'll have to rescue even more people in order to match up with you. Later on, you want to wish for health. When time is getting close to running out, they have to kill you to win. Potentially, time them out and win that way. Next up, change energy. This energy raises your power level, which lets you fight the raider. If your power level is lower than the raider, the raider will brush your normal attacks off. You cannot fight the raider with normal attacks unless you are the same power level. Your special moves will go through though. If the raider is being punched by someone who is just as strong as them, you being too weak will get that teammate to be thrown aside too. That brush aside animation trumps everything. Change energy can be found in a few ways. It's in boxes, destroyable environments like jars and crates, vending machines, and you get some from helping civilians. If you're working alone, grab it whenever you can. If you're with a teammate, try to gauge whether it makes sense for you to take it or not. If you're at a level where you can fight the raider while your teammate is weaker, it might be better for them to have it. If your teammate is hogging all of the energy, you might need to split off and get your own from other places. It's not impossible to play without gathering energy. Beating up the raider isn't the only way to win, and you can stealth, but I personally suck at stealth, so I like to fight it out every since I, uh, yeah, I, I like to fight. Next up in terms of self-defense tools, the rocket launcher. The rocket launcher comes in two varieties, normal, which has one shot, and gold, which has three shots. These rockets momentarily stun the raider and can be used to stall or interrupt them when they're doing things like drinking people or, I guess, making a wish. The rocket can be shot while you're transformed with your change energy. Using it to help a teammate from far away before flying away can save someone's life. And if you have the golden launcher, contemplate how many shots you're willing to use as well as how you space them out. Normal rocket launchers can be purchased through vending machines, but I don't think it's a good idea to purchase those. You can buy change energy with that money. If you can't buy any more change energy, yeah, a rocket launcher might be a good choice, but there's other stuff too. Next up is Vegeta's gloves. They let you shoot one Gallic gun. They deal a bit more damage than the rocket launcher and actually blow the raider away. They make for a good emergency weapon, especially once again while you're transformed. And if you have a choice between one of these and one of the normal rocket launchers, definitely choose Vegeta's gloves. Between this and the golden rocket launcher, I'm not entirely sure yet. The next item I want to talk about is my personal favorite, the energy drink. This drink comes in two varieties, Sprite and Mellow Yellow. The green drinks restore 50% of your energy. The gold drink restores all of your energy. These do not increase your power level. They just refresh the charge that you use to transform, like a senzu bean. Green drinks can be bought from vending machines. If you find yourself ahead of the raider in strength, buying two drinks lets you get a second transformation immediately, so you can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them for longer, or you can use it as an emergency, hey, I need to transform again so I can fly away. But if you find a golden drink, which can only be found in the actual boxes that you get items out of. You carry it. You drop literally everything you are carrying, and you carry it. Even if you are not strong enough, you carry it for your strongest teammate so they can fight for a longer period of time. This item is an immediate transformation. It is insane and could mean the difference between dying and holding off the raider for upwards of minutes. Another item I'd like to talk about is Krillin's bike. Use the bike if you have the space pod available or if you have the strength and energy to fight the raider. It is a risk to give your position away, 
but the radar can sense energy every 30 seconds anyway, and that sense lasts a long time. So moving faster might just be better off for you. And if you can transform and fight the raider, or if you have a space pod nearby and can get away, then there's no problem in baiting the raider towards you. Being the one that gets chased means that others get to be safe. So, I don't know, good luck making the decision? It's definitely a more aggressive mobility tool, but it's also a lot of fun. Next, I'd like to go over the map. Area A, the northeasternmost region of the map, is comprised of a cave system beneath a plateau and a valley. It also hosts every large body of water for swimming and underwater evasive maneuvers. That and the verticality of this area make it a great place to hide from the raider, but it can also be dangerous to get out of without the ability to fly. The space pod can't be summoned underground, so making sure that there's a proper escape route is really important. Someone may choose to explore this place first because it has all of these great hiding spots, or to get it over with so that they can move to more prominent areas next. Area B is the southeastern region, with Frieza's spaceship in the bottom right corner and a small village to the west. The valleys of this map are more open than Area A, but this region is a fantastic resource for getting stronger. The spaceship and the village are generally places where civilians will show up. If not, they're places where you have a ton of breakable objects to get resources, and if not, they both have vending machines, which make it a good place to revisit later if the area's still around. It's one of my personal favorites to explore, at least. Then there's Area C. I hate Area C. Half of it's a wide open area with nowhere to hide. Half of it is World 1-5 from New Super Mario Bros. And the best part of it is the back half of Area B. The chests on the mushrooms are annoying to get and put you in the open. The vending machine in this area is right in the open. It's the easiest map to fully search since you can get a high vantage point and see everything quickly, but I still don't like being there for too long. It's best used as a place to pass through quickly. Area D is generally the highest energy area. Civilians in abundance, vending machines everywhere, and the most breakable furniture means that even if you can't find the energy directly, you can loot it and go somewhere else. The buildings are easy enough to hide inside, and being able to jump out when the walls are destroyed make it not impossible to escape using grappling hooks, quick movement, the space pod, and a transformation. When I played, I found that the raider would most often destroy this area first, just because of how much can come out of it. Area E, on the other hand, is the emptiest area of them all. I don't really know what to recommend for this area. The bike helps to traverse it, but there are less spaces for you to hide. I've personally liked saving this area for last and using it as a place to combat the raider if I'm not at the Cell Games arena. I feel like I'm missing something with this area. I genuinely don't know what it is, though. Maybe that it's between area... D and Area A, so it... I don't know. Finally, there's Area Z. This area is straight in the middle and doesn't really have much going for it aside from the ring. The houses do exist, they have furniture, sometimes they have a civilian, and they do have vending machines outside of them. But other than that, I would honestly say only come here when the time machine arrives. And that's it for now. When the full game comes out, hopefully I'll be able to look over what are the best skills, what are the best transformations, but honestly, I feel like it's mostly a personal playstyle type thing. One of my friends was rocking Krillin's shoes, and I could not aim with it for the slightest, so instead I used Solar Flare. All in all, I think this game is going to be fantastic, even though it doesn't have the same kind of level of energy that a fighting game has where you're immediately on the same level, I feel like that's one of the biggest charms of it. Suddenly, the mind game isn't about if I'm blocking an overhead or blocking a low, it's whether or not I'm able to properly hide, whether I'm able to bluff my opponent, whether the raider is able to properly tell who's who in terms of which power levels are which, if they attack the wrong person and end up getting beaten for it, or if the survivor is able to bluff the raider and hold them off. How does teamwork work? How do you go it alone? I really like it. So, to all who've watched this long, thank you for watching. Hopefully, I'll see you out there when it comes out. Also, I forgot about Zenny, but Zenny's just money. You exchange it for goods and services. I like to spend it on change energy, and if I've already powered up as much as I can, I'll buy a drink. Other than that, uh, not really much else. All right. Thank you for watching. Have a nice day.